Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of my grandfather, I say thank you. On behalf of my father, I say thank you. On behalf of my family, I say thank you. But to this American Federation of Teachers, I say thank you. To our president, President Randy Weingarten, we thank you for your leadership. Uh, to Rabbi Sharon, uh, to Tier Jones, who is the master logistical wizard of this group. We thank you. Uh, to the secretary for the introduction, we, we thank you. I, I want to just take a few moments. I, I'm so grateful that you were able to show uh, this film, and we hope that you can use it in any of the institutions where you work. It is free. It was designed specifically to educate a new generation about the struggle to vote. And I would be remiss if I did not give a major shout out to the Chicago Teachers Union. We are so proud of you. We love you and the work uh, that you are doing. Praise God. Amen. Reclaiming our future, you the stewards of democracy, the midwives of dreams, the holders of a future yet to be born. I greet this federation, this cadre of educators, this collective of first responders, our repairers of the breach, who hold Takum Olam in one hand and Ubuntu in the other. For you are have a great calling as educators and as first responders. Democracy is held uh, not in the hands of those who uh, consider themselves to be venture capitalists and lobbyists. But democracy is held in the hands of mothers and teachers and artists, prophets, first responders, and poets. And you hold special tools that have been crafted by God. Tools the internet cannot corrupt, social media cannot stop, and disinformation cannot exile from our civic consciousness. What is this tool you, you speak of? The unyielding belief in the human spirit, a power of empathy and compassion and moral imagination that believes that every single child has the ability not only to learn, but also to thrive. The belief in human dignity that as a person takes their last breath in an ICU to believe that they should be comfortable and should have dignity in the process. You are the forgers of a moral imagination for this democracy. And there have been people uh, before us who understood this power that, that you, stand, uh, you stand on their shoulders. Like a gentleman by the name of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, who, when he received one book for someone who was leaning toward abolition, he memorized that entire book, learned the letters and the pronunciation and the sounds, and used to keep a piece of bread in his back pocket that when he was walking along uh, the Bay of Baltimore, when he would encounter his Irish friends, he would say, give me uh, a spelling lesson and I'll give you a piece of bread. The power of this idea this idea of democracy. We stand on the shoulders of, of people such as Joanne Robinson. Many people don't know her unless you are from Alabama, in a place known as Montgomery. We, we love to talk about Dr. King and about uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Abernathy and Rosa Parks. Yes, she sat on the bus, but the real organizer of what was known as the bus boycott was a sister by the name of Joanne Robinson. A sister who was part of the Women's Political Council, an organizer, worked at a historically black college known as Alabama State University. And after Rosa Parks was arrested, all the men were arguing, trying to figure out what are they going to do next? 
Joanne Robinson came into the meeting and then pulled Rosa Parks aside and says, I know what to do. Let the men argue. I'm going to go over to Alabama State and we are going to make some flyers on a mimeograph machine. 35,000 they made in nine hours. Placed them on the doorstep of every black person. They woke up in the morning and said there's a boycott and the brother said, I guess we need to join. It's the power of organizing in order to reshape the democracy. And here we are in Boston, the space where people lift up the name of Horace Mann. Horace Mann who understood about common education. And I do not in any way throw any shade at Horace Mann, but if we want to understand the fullness of education, you need to make your way down to a space in South Carolina, Charleston to be specific, about a person, a person by the name of Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls along with his wife, they decided that they were going to be free in this enslaved society. And so they hatched a plan with 11 other enslaved Africans to do something that had never done, been done before. They decided to steal a Confederate warship. The amazing thing about racism is racism is arrogant and ignorant at the same time. And they would allow black people to clean the ship. They'd allow black people to, to fix the ship. They'd allow black people to drive the ship. But they didn't think anybody black could ever be the captain of the ship. And so Robert Smalls and his wife said one night when they decided, uh, when the, the captain decided to get drunk, as he always did, and go out into the city and uh, to some particular brothel, they brought their families on board, along with 11 other Africans, and said, we're rolling up out of here. They put on, it was Robert Smalls who put on a Confederate outfit. It was still dark. They could see the silhouette of a man, but didn't know he was a black man as they made their way to the harbor because Robert Smalls had a photographic memory, had been memorizing all of the Confederate, all the Confederate codes. And when they got to that harbor, all of a sudden Robert Smalls went like this and did all the little things and the harbor master said, go ahead with your bad self. And they sailed on out of the harbor. <laughs> the story was not over then because the Union forces put a blockade on the harbor. They said that any Confederate ship that was to come out of the Charleston Harbor, it was to be fired upon immediately. And as the planter, the ship that Robert Smalls and his wife had liberated, this thing is better than Oceans 8, 9, 10, 11, I'm telling you. <laughs> as it was coming closer to the Union ship, they were about to fire upon that ship and they did not know what to do. And a fog had swept into the Charleston Harbor and they could not see uh, the ship clearly. And it was Robert Small's wife said, find me a white sheet. Let's run it up the pole and hopefully they'll be able to see the white sheet uh, flying. They couldn't see it because of the fog. And as they aimed their guns, they said one, two, and as if on cue, all of a sudden the sun came out and burned off the fog. They saw the flag and they said, hold your fire. They stepped on board the ship looking for some white people, didn't find anybody white, and Robert Smalls with his child, Robert Jr. in hand, lifting him up to the sky. He says, I believe we have some ammunition on this ship that Lincoln can use in this battle. <laughs> the story doesn't stop there, y'all. It gets gooder. He goes north and he joins the Union Army, becomes the first officer in the history of the United States to be a person of African descent. He then goes back south and buys the house where he was a slave. You got to be a bad brother to buy the space where you were enslaved. But he had so much compassion. He allowed the mistress to live on the property, not in the big house, the little house out back. I want to make that clear but it was not enough. He said that these uh, former enslaved Africans who had now been freed as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation need education. And so he formed schools, what we would now call early childhood development, some of the first for black children. But it still was not enough. He decided that he was gonna run for Congress. He ran for Congress and won, and then passed a law 
a law that would make it compulsory education from K through 12 for everybody, for every freed person in America, that we have a public school system, not just because of Horace Mann, but a brother down in South Carolina and his wife by the name of Robert Smalls. They were defenders of democracy. You stand on their shoulders. We stand on their shoulders. And it seems as if in this moment in America, in the words of in the black church tradition, we would say it seems to be midnight in America right now. It seems as if the sun has set and darkness has come upon the land. Uh, but I'm here to let you know that with all of the changes that have happened in this nation, that now a court seems to have a confederate or antebellum framework in terms of how they even look at legislation. The fact that voter suppression is still, uh, still rampant in our nation and the attack upon education and upon educators seems to be continual. You can't even talk about black history nowadays. Otherwise, someone will say that it's destructive and not patriotic. The true patriot is one who wants education for everybody. The true patriot is the one who simply wants to teach the truth of American history. Slavery and abolition, the women's suffrage movement and the labor movement, the civil rights movement, this is democracy. And I know that it seems as if it is midnight in America. But President Weingarten, I have some good news for everybody here. It's the bad news is it's midnight. The good news is it's midnight. Somebody missed their shout. The bad news, it's midnight. The good news, it's midnight. You're still missing it, so let me help you out. Nighttime is all the way up to 11.59. But as soon as you move into midnight, it means that a new day has come, but the sun has yet to rise. The bad news is that it is midnight. But the good news is it's midnight. And I know that morning is coming in America. If I may borrow a remix from Martin Luther King Jr., I know morning is coming because Carlisle is right that no lie can last forever. Morning is coming because William Cullen Bryant is right when he says truth crushed to the earth shall rise again. Morning is coming because James Russell Lowell is right that truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but truth, uh, yet the scaffold sways the future. Ah, uh, morning is coming because there's a word that says you shall reap what you sow. Morning is coming in these yet to be United States of America. In these yet to be United States, I can see a time when the sun shall rise, where people of different backgrounds and faiths shall stand together, whether you are black or white, Muslim or Methodist, Asian or atheist, Latino or Lutheran, progressive or Pentecostal, Hindu or humanist, Jew or Gentile, queer or Quaker, agnostic or Anglican, Sikh or sanctified, Baptist or Buddhist, ghetto or country, redneck or reform, urban or suburban, whether you graduated magna cum laude or just thank you lord, urban or suburban, we shall be able to sing in the words of that great South Central poet by the name of Kendrick Lamar, we gonna be all right, we gonna be all right, let us reclaim our democracy. Dr. Otis Moss the third. You see why we invited him?